Hey, hi everyone. So thanks for joining. Um, welcome to the returning to officiating panel discussion beyond COVID-19. Um, again, thanks for all those that are live and uh, we're recording this session. So anyone who doesn't catch it live obviously can, can catch up later as well. So in terms of the session, um, we're going to cover some, some key points um, related to match officials returning to sport. Um, so not just football, any sport, we hope to, that sort of crosses over into various sports. Um, obviously we'll give specific examples and the participants from on the panel will give specific examples from certain sports. But hopefully you'll be able to take that into your own officiating or own experiences and sort of make sense of that for yourself. Um, what I'll do initially is introduce, introduce the panel members um, and then we'll go into uh, what we're going to cover and take it from there in terms of the discussion. Just as a couple of things, if you could mute um, your buttons, find your mute button for the discussion, that'd be great. There is a chance for Q&A towards the end. So if you do have a question, please use the chat facility um, and I'll try and pick those up as they, as they come through. We might not be able to get to all of them, but I'll certainly try and pick up as many as I can. So, um, if we crack on, so my name is Dr. Tom Webb. I'm chairing the session today. I am a senior lecturer at the University of Portsmouth, for those who don't know me. Um, and I'm also founder of the Referee and Match Official Research Network, um, which we run from the University of Portsmouth. Um, I'm involved with the Football Collective, and the majority of my research takes place with match officials um, in sport from a variety of different disciplines and subject areas. Um, I'm fortunate today to be joined by a number of highly esteemed and decorated people on, on the panel. So um, if I introduce them one by one and they'll give a bit of an overview of their background. So also joined by Professor Carlo Castagna, who is at the University of Rome Tor Vergata in Rome. And Carlo is also part of the technical department for the Italian Football Federation and oversees the Italian Serie A referees from a physiological perspective. Uh, Carlo, if you'd like to talk a little bit about your background. Hi. Okay. Hi, everybody. Yes, I'm Carlo Castagna, and I'm still uh, this uh, then the, for the next year uh, with the Serie A referee because I've just been confirmed by, by my federation. That's uh, that's fine. And so that's my yeah. You're right. I'm uh, uh, so I deal with uh, the uh, fitness uh, training of uh, the Serie A referees mainly. And I, uh, I, I'm in the, uh, I've been in this position since 2007, but I, I'm working with uh, elite level referees since uh, 1991. So it's almost 30 years that I work with referees. So yes, uh, <laughs> I don't know what to add more about that. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's great, Carlo. I think I think the uh, your experience with with referees at that level speaks for itself, and will We'll unpack that as we as we go through. So thank you very much. Uh, we're also going, uh, joined by Dr. Phil Cooper, MBE. Um, Phil is uh, founder and trustee of State of Mind, and also works in mental health. So if I pass over to Phil. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, so my name is Phil Cooper. I work in the National Health Service of the UK, uh, specialising in mental health and drug and alcohol misuse. Uh, I also love sport, uh, my passion, my favourite sports rugby league. Uh, I have a massive appreciation of the role of match officials. And uh, in, this, in the other part of my world, in terms of a mental health charity, uh, we try to use the power of sport uh, and harness that to improve the mental fitness of players, fans, communities, and obviously match officials. Uh, I suppose ultimately our goal is to try and change and alter the perception of match officials in a more positive way. Uh, and we have a couple of different sort of projects on on the way. But I know COVID-19 is having a massive impact on human beings generally, and it'll have a big impact on the return of officials when they're actually getting back out there. So, so thanks Tom for the uh, invite and uh, look forward to the rest of the uh, webinar. Great, thanks Phil. Um, we're also joined by Jan Terhamsel. Uh, Jan is a blogger and instructor um, at DutchReferee.com. Jan's also a referee in the Netherlands and he, he's also involved with the Federation in the Netherlands, KMVB training referees. Uh, hi, Jan. Hi, good, e 
Good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, my name is Jan, and it's pretty much said what I've been up to. I've been a referee for a long time, and um, talking about referees on my referee website, and um, also active referee as well. So I'm still refereeing. I can't wait for my first game of uh, after COVID. It's about 120 days now, so uh, I'm really looking forward to my uh, to my next game. Great stuff. Thank you, Jan. Um, it'll be really interesting to hear the experiences from the Netherlands and, and, and the differences between the countries as well. And on that note, we've also got Dr. Jacob Tingle. Jacob is um, from the United States. He's at Trinity University and he's the director of, in the Office of Experiential Learning. But he also uh, researches extensively with match officials. Hi there, Jacob. Hi, Tom. Thanks for thanks for having me, and it's it's wonderful to see so many folks here. Um, I am a little bit about <clears throat> my background. In addition to um, most of my research being focused on, um, on on community as it impacts recruitment and retention, <laughs> referees and match officials. Uh, I also, um, for 20 years, uh, was a college basketball referee. Uh, and in the in the here in the United States, and then my my sports background is is mostly uh, with basketball, but um, I have two young sons who play baseball and uh, and soccer, um, you know, football. Um, so I've I've become much more interested in what happens in those spaces with our umpires and uh, and match officials also. So um, I, I'm I'm really looking inter I'm interested to learn from other the other panelists today as well. Great, thanks Jacob. And then uh, finally, we're also joined by Michael Cook and Michael uh, works for Sport Northern Ireland over in Northern Ireland. And as will become clear in the course of the session, Michael has been involved in initiating um, quite an innovative programme of support for match officials in Northern Ireland. Uh, afternoon, Michael. Uh, afternoon, Tom. Thank you very much for the invite. Uh, delighted to, to be with everyone here this afternoon. Um, Part of my role, as Tom has mentioned, within Sport NA is looking at our workforce, or sporting workforce over here, um, including volunteers, coaches, and notably officials. And as part of my remit, uh, I've been asked to support and develop uh, a program for, for officials to help their learning and development, but to also create a community of practice where officials, referees, umpires from a multi-sport approach can come together, um, can learn, Kind of a mechanism of support around them, and I think that's going to be very prevalent um, in the in the uh, COVID period we're in now and, and post COVID as well. So, um, like Jacob had said, I'm very interested to hear uh, the perspectives uh, from from the other speakers here this afternoon. Great, thanks, Michael. Um, and I think that's a really good point to start us off with the discussion. Um, I think we've all seen the return to to sport over the last few weeks and obviously depending on the country we're from we're at different periods in terms of that that return to sport if you like and competitive sport in particular we've seen professional leagues come back in various sports although some have come back quicker than others and we've seen how the focus and quite understandably so has perhaps been on the players um, in those professional leagues and, and what, how it's going to affect them and what it might mean in terms of their performance and whether um, home form will be affected or whether it favours away teams and all this sort of stuff. And perhaps in that discussion a little bit, that we're a little bit lost with the match officials um, and, and how it would affect them and what might what the impact might be for those match officials. Um, and if we start off with, with Carlo um, over in Italy, who oversees the Serie A referees, the top referees in Italy, What's your experience being, Carlo, of the return to action for the referees? So that's an uh, uh, okay. Uh, thank you, Tom, for this uh, no tricky question, actually. <laughs> okay, it's really complicated because actually now it's uh, you know, uh, a process uh, ongoing, of course, because actually, you know, we are monitoring, uh, you know, the return to play of our referees. Uh, so that's I can... Uh, I'll uh, start saying that, you know, as I uh, told you before, uh, that we, we were locked in a cover channel that is the, our, our training camp uh, for of, yeah, 20 days. And so we had uh, our referees, you know, uh, trained and tested because, uh, you know, that it was uh, about, uh, you, know, uh, you know, the lockdown. 
uh, was uh, multifaceted because uh, uh, Italy, as you know, was uh, one of the most affected you know, country in the world, unfortunately. So that uh, we, you have to know that in Italy, we have uh, 60 training camps all over uh, Italy that deals, uh, that take care of, uh, of our referees. And so we, have, uh, we had to shut down them. And so mainly our referee had to train at home. And then, you know, that uh, because of the government rule, they uh, were not allowed to train outside. And so that's, you know, that, so I had to direct them, you know, the, from, uh, you know, the tra for their uh, own training. And then, so when they are, the, you know, the, how to say, the uh, anti-coronavirus me uh, measures were, uh, you know, a little bit, uh, you know, uh, lifted, you know, and so they, they were allowed to train outside. So single training sessions, again, so that, and then uh, alone, then almost them, they trained in their, you know, garage. So they send me video clip or, or their facilities. And so I had to, to, yeah, to adapt the training session to what they had. And so then, you know, that, uh, then, you know, for, uh, for a number of reasons, uh, the Federation, mainly economically, <laughs> economical, reason uh, they decide to get back to the you know that to restart the, to play and then you know that we had uh, four weeks you know to prepare ourselves and then uh, so after a couple of weeks uh, we decided to uh, you know set the training camp in Coverciano that was uh, that started from the 3rd of June until the 23rd and actually there they were uh, you know they I run training session uh, and uh, also that, you know, uh, the, uh, we tested them in order to see if uh, their fitness was uh, appropriate for return to play. And, but anyway, mainly, you know, our concern was not that fitness because we know pretty well that they are so professional that uh, take care of themselves, especially other yeah, pretty much uh, concerned, uh, addicted, you know, to exercise, you know, to keep themselves uh, fit. But anyway, the problem was, uh, you know, medical because I actually know that, you know, <laughs> We were in this situation because of coronavirus, and so that we had, you know, at the beginning, just you know, the the first that we arrived in Coverciano, uh, so uh, tests uh, we, we had been tested for, you know, the I don't know uh, the tampon and uh, the blood, you know, to know if we we were affected by coronavirus. Luckily, and nobody was uh, uh, had been affected by coronavirus, and then. Uh, we, uh, you know, started up uh, the training session that were mainly, you know, you know uh, divided into training session morning and afternoon. Our concern was you not know, to provide a product to the to football that mainly, you know, that uh, refereeing is a service for the football. You know, this is a <laughs> at least this is a, how they appreciate that. And so that's uh, actually that my concern, our concern was uh, mining Rizzoli and. Uh, uh, you know, member of the staff to not uh, uh, have a, not injure, you know, uh, players. And so referees, referees that we are considering players, you know, that in this in this game. And so that uh, our concern with that. And then, okay, they are still uh, training alone because uh, we are still we cannot still uh, know that. Uh, you know, uh, do uh, mass training session at least for the referee. The you know the the, the players they train uh, in, in uh, because they uh, they have a, a club life. You know, and so they test themselves uh, every two days, and we don't and we don't have the, such opportunity you now to do that. So that uh, and then you know that um, uh, what are the take home message from this situation? That actually you know that the referee are you know uh, appointed. Uh, uh, more often, uh, quite few of them are a, a, every uh, three days. This is quite unusual for most of them. Not for the international level referees, of course. And uh, and you know that also there because uh, in Italy again uh, we have uh, the VAR running. They are all the the time uh, away home, you know, because uh, if they are not in, in the pitch, they are in the room and uh, all. Uh, 
watching the te watching the telly, a special telly game that is more stressful than <laughs> actually, you know, see a game from home, of course. And then, uh, and then, uh, so today, yeah, uh, I received a message from uh, one of the referee that I'm, you know, I'm training and told me that I did uh, 10,000 kilometers by my car in uh, since June, and it means that actually they travel a lot. Uh, <laughs> you know that. So that's uh, and then also that they are tired, not just you know because of the game, because the game are pretty much slower than before, because uh, you know the, for a number of reasons, because uh, we are playing in the heat in Italy. You know that's like you know that they are 30, 35 degree Celsius, and so that's uh, that's a problem because usually this time of the year we are used to to rest, you know, at least not not to play game, mm -hmm. and so build up the you know uh, the condition for the next season so that's a number you know of uh, uh you know of factors that actually affects uh, the uh, the performance uh, also the the mental status of the other referees of course that's really interesting carlo and thank you for that overview and i think some of us now you know seeing the challenges that are faced by the top referees in in italy you know, we'll start to understand a little bit about actually, you know, this is, this is actually really complex. You know, it's not as straightforward as people just come back and start officiating yeah. again in whatever sport that might be. And of course, then we've got people at sort of lower levels of sport, which, you know, face similar challenges in some respects. You know, they haven't been officiating for a long period of time. Um, and then some other challenges which, which will be unique to lower levels of sport. Um, and I wondered in, in, in the States, Jacob, what's, what's happening there? Yeah, um, I think it's, it's really interesting. I think you have very real differences between what's, you know, professional athletes um, and, and professional leagues, right? MLS is, is back, um, the, the USL is back, and the, and the NWSL have, has had a tournament. The National Basketball Association is starting up and, and Major League Baseball. And, and certainly those two, that, those last two bigger leagues, they've been able to, you know, to create bubbles. Um, and, and unlike what I've seen in, um, as I've been watching European football, how it's come back where, where you're playing in front of empty stadiums, but, but you're still, you still have a home match. Um, so, for example, the, the National Basketball Association—they're all traveling to the, you know, to the city of Orlando, um, and they're, you know, sequestered in hotels for three days, and they're going to be, or for excuse me, three weeks, or um, and they're doing all their training camps there. Um, I, I think the the players' manual um, is 129 pages of what they can and can't do, um, and, and the referees are in that same spot. So, so thinking about as as Carlo was talking about, you know, kind of isolation. Um, and travel stressors, they, they won't have the travel stressor of driving or, you know, or needing to get on a plane the way they normally would, which, is, which are massive stressors for them normally. Um, but but the, the stressors of being isolated um, and, and only being able to engage with other people who are allowed in that bubble, um, that's going to be really interesting to me to think about from a mental health standpoint and, you know, think about what, um, you know what, what Phil might say about about what that does to someone's psyche, but then also not just that isolation, but being then also physically distant and not even being able to go home, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I wonder what some of the long term effects um, uh, uh, for those referees um, and, and match officials might be. But then the big question at the lower levels is: Will we even play sports? So I, I work at a um, at a, you know the university I work at. They're they're the NCAA uh, is the National Collegiate Athletic Association um, is the governing body for, for not every university, um, but, but most universities that play a sport. Um, they're the governing body in the United States. Um, and there are three, three divisions and the, and the divisions are, are, are really probably, there are other differences, but probably the easiest way to think th about them are, are the big time college sports that University of Michigan or Southern California or those places are, are full scholarship division one. And then there's division two where there's, there's multiple scholarships, but not as much money. And then division three is not uh, is everything is non-revenue uh, generating and the athletes do not receive any compensation for, for their sports. 
uh, for, for, for participating uh, in a sport, right? So at the division three level, two days ago, the, uh, the, the uh, governance council uh, uh, put out a statement that they are, we are not playing any fall sports. So American football, men's and women's soccer, volleyball, our, our cross country, um, none of those sports are being played at that level on colleges in, in, in the United States, at the, again, at the Division three level. It's important to note that uh, around 50%, a little less than 50% of all college sports are at that Division three level. So while we don't, you don't know about Trinity playing football, we, we know about the University of Texas or, again, Michigan or whoever, um, most athletes in the United States that play college sports play at this level. So without sports, what do match officials even do, right? I think, I think that's a huge concern uh, for, for colleagues of mine that I've talked to is, is how do you, you know, it's, it's one thing that how do you stay sharp for 120 days knowing, you know, you know like Jan said, that there is going to be a return, but what do you do when you're a, a football referee, an American football referee, and, and, there's, no, and there's no sport? Right. And so there's uh, what, what do you do if you're a soccer referee and there's and there's no college sport and, and there's a real likelihood that high school sports won't happen um, or it'll it'll be different based on you know, the, the geographic parameters. Right. So so there might be sports in in this state, but not in this state or even in this muni municipality, but not in this municipality. And so there are some real. Um, you know, from my standpoint, some real concerns for um, retention, right, is, is what's that going to look like if I don't know if I'm even going to be able to, to, to do this? At, you know, at, at, at what point do I just hang up my whistle uh, and say, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to do this anymore? But then also from a recruitment standpoint, how do you recruit people to, to, to participate, uh, you know, in, in this wonderful activity if, if there isn't, you know, isn't something that's going to go on. And I'll just, I'll just end with, you know, a personal anecdote. So um, in March, um, my, my two sons, they are, um, they are in third grade and seventh grade. So I don't know how that translates over to other people's uh, school systems, but they're, they're, they're 10 and 12 or nine and 12 and they were playing um, little league baseball. And so when, when March um, and, and everybody went on lockdown, a little league baseball shut down. Um, in early June, late May, uh, it, it was determined that we would be able to, to play Little League Baseball again. And so the, the league that they played in put all of these three or four pages of parameters and guidelines and masks and, you know, what parents can and can't do and what coaches can and can't do. Um, they did three weeks of practice and they had one game. Um, and then two days after the first game, the league shut down again. Uh, so, so again, you know, just in terms of those baseball umpires, getting, you know, getting their four weeks of preparation and getting everything back and you go out and you start doing your craft and then, you know, shut down. Um, and, and then, and so that was, that was really interesting from that perspective. And then the last thing I'll say is I've, I've, I've heard um, from some colleagues that there are um, almost kind of, um, how, how would you say these, uh, I don't know, like um, tournaments that are like pop-up tournaments that are, like <laughs> where where some parent will call and 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 rent a field for a day uh and then and then tell eight other teams and so all of those teams are coming and they're just like you know piling on and then when the park finds out wait there's a tournament here they shut it <laughs> they shut it down those people are never allowed to come back to that that ground and then they just go and find the next place and so what i wonder from a match for an umpire standpoint or a match official standpoint is what does that mean if if they're kind of doing that level of, I don't know, you know, secrecy or piracy or whatever you want to say in terms of running the games, are they putting the, F, the level of effort in terms of care for the match officials? Are there protocols in place for masking or, you know, all of those kinds of things? Um, so, so that's where we are, right? The, the, the big question is, are there going to be games? And, and when there are games, especially at, at the youth and amateur level, um, what are we going to do for, for umpires and match officials, right? How are, we, how are we going to treat them? I think that's great. Uh, really interesting, Jacob, is, a, is it, you know, a sort of 
different perspective in terms of you know what's happening around the world as well and if i can bring in what i'd like to do is bring jan then michael in from a dutch perspective and also from um, what's happening in northern ireland and, and how you might deal with that in northern ireland as well and then after that we'll fill to sort of unfortunately get the uh <laughs> get get to bring all that together in terms of a mental health perspective which i think we can see already there's a number of challenges at different levels i think that that we might have to face so so jan what, what about the the netherlands what is that is any of this sort of um chiming with with what you've seen and and and, and how it's been with you yeah i do recognize it also what jacob said about having no sports schedule yet first of all there was the motivation factor for training as well uh, lots of referees were uh having a, having an empty agenda or calendar and they were not having any games so they think why should i train or they don't feel the motivation to start getting fit um it, that is also a good point that crossed across um in the referees minds they didn't want to train because they think there's no game at all, so why do I start training? So it, yeah, they sh they didn't stay fit, and it's also it's not mental, but it's physical. Uh, something they should definitely work on. Um, but what I also think, like in the Netherlands, we could sh start training again from mid May. So we we've been training for about two months now. Um, first of first, it started with uh, social distance training. But from the 1st of July, teams can train again, so they can train and do practice matches. Um, there are friendlies organized again. So uh, that, that gave it all a much different perspective. So what protocols are in place um, if, if these games are on? Um, and last week or two weeks ago, the came to be our football association launched a protocol um, also for referees, but there were plenty of protocols for players and how they should behave. But what should referees do? Mm. Uh, referees come to a club, um, you don't shake hands, but you go to a dressing room. Is the dressing room big enough for a referee team? But normally you get small dressing rooms. Uh, how you get fit into it with, with the distance. Um, there are different aspects to manage, like players uh, need to stay at a one meter, uh, one and a half meter in the Netherlands, also on the bench. Um, it's not up to the referee to force them to go out but there are protocols in place to um they have to talk to the manager or the captain and um, that's why they came up with some protocols to to work with it um similar to talking to your assistant referees where do you do that and in the netherlands there are lots of parents or we call them club assistant referees um then you don't know them so you don't know what distance they kept at home you don't know what they're up to uh, they were not checked as well, so uh, you, the advice is just to do the talks with them outside. Uh, we need to check player passes. Are they eligible to eligible to play? Um, you can't do it in a dressing room because you're in, in a small room together with players, so you do it outside. So lots of things to, uh, to think about. And, and one thing that crossed my mind as well when uh, Carlo was talking about every professional referee gets tested for Corona, in the Netherlands, if you go to an amateur game, the referees are not tested, neither the players. Um, that makes it, everyone has to keep the distance. But what you see, I think all over Europe, you see like uh, Corona or COVID spreading again, and you see local lockdowns. So you see that not everyone is paying attention to social distancing. So you're going onto the field of play and some people might have a party the day before or the week before or a birthday. And they, they just come together and not everyone's paying attention to the distance. Um, yeah, if you're going out in big groups, you're coming on the football pitch, uh, 22 people uh, and a referee team as well. Um, yeah, what's the risk for you as a referee? And, and that crosses your mind as well. Uh, what does it mean for me if I go on to the field play and, and have my games? I'm really excited for my first game. It's, it's on the 8th of August. Yeah, in the back of my mind, I still keep thinking about, yeah, what does it bring to me? It, it's a bit exciting as well because, yeah, you have to deal with 22 players, lots of substitu substitutions as well. Every team might have five or seven subs, so you've got a big group of, with 
including coaches, over 30 to 40 people. Um, yeah, it's something you have to think about and, and, and it, yeah, it crosses your mind. But I'm very happy that there's a date set. So you got something to work forward to mm. and I'm really looking forward to be back on the field of play. That's great. Yeah, and I think I think it's really interesting that you know the to hear from a you know the, the perspective of a, a match official and going back and obviously you're quite experienced and you've trained referees as well for the association and and things like that and and it, and it strikes me from what we've talked about so far that the same things keep coming out. You're quite experienced, but you can imagine a younger, less experienced referee that's going to be quite daunting, you know. And I think. Jacob mentioned, and, and we've said, and, and Carlo even mentioned some of the pressures at the, to the top level, and, and this recruitment and retention keeps keeps coming back, doesn't it? That that perhaps we might have a problem with that. And I don't know, Michael, in, in your experience in, in Northern Ireland from sport returning, and, and also from the work you've been doing with match officials, what issues do you think there might be? And also, how, how might we deal with this? Support's obviously going to be important, but... But I think we've got a real issue here, potentially, with not just retaining those that we've already got, but recruiting people. As Jacob said, what are we going to recruit them to if there's no sport? Absolutely. Um, the last community of practice session that we, that we had in Northern Ireland, I had two very different conversations with officials in that session. Um, one, one of um, the referees was very much like Jan, could not wait to get back onto the pitch, was really looking forward to being able to referee a game again, couldn't wait. Um, the second referee, who, however, that I talked to um, said during the COVID period, he had a lot of time to think. And he was like, I'm, I was on the fence whether I would go and referee again or not. And this uh, period has made me think, and I actually, uh, I don't want to go back. And I think, I think I've actually refereed my last game. And I thought that was, that was really interesting from a retention uh, point of view. Um, and if you can imagine, that type of conversation or that th thought processes, that thought process is going along with other referees, then that's going to be a real challenge for a number of sports to hold on to the referees that they have and retain those guys. But as you quite rightly say, Tom, the new recruitment of, of refs, I think national sporting organizations need to take that into consideration. What does our current re uh, referee population look like during the COVID period? And what is that going to be like when we return? The support aspect, which you also mentioned, I think is really important right now. Um, being able to offer some sort of service, some sort of communication, some sort of connection um, to the referees that are out there. We know it can be a really challenging position. We know it can be lonely at times. And I think developing um, communities and opportunities to, to allow conversations to happen between referees offer a real, offers a really good opportunity um, to make them feel part of something bigger. And when we do return to sport, um, that they're in the best possible condition, they're in the best possible mental state, and they're in the uh, they feel really supported to get back in and get involved again. Yeah, I think that's absolutely, Michael, really, really important, and hopefully that does mitigate some of the issues that we might have in terms of well, we've had an elongated break, haven't we? I know we get a break every year, you know, which is a summer break, and it tends to be depending on the sport. Not all sports operate to that calendar but there's generally a natural break but that natural break isn't three four five six months you know that's that's the problem we face and and sometimes you know we've heard from Jan and Michael you talk about the the match officials you've talked to and, and one was looking to get back and really excited and so is Jan and that's great but not everyone's necessarily going to be in that that situation or that mindset and this is what I'd like you know to come to Phil and Phil, you've heard some of these these uh, arguments at a professional and a more localised level, but we, we, we keep going back to the same sort of issues in terms of returning and retention and recruitment. And, and then how does this affect the individual from a mental health viewpoint? Okay, th thanks for that. Uh, and yeah, fas fascinating uh, insights from everyone. So uh, I think the interesting thing is that everyone who's a participant or watching this later on, will all have their own views and fears and uncertainty because they're the sort of things that we're all facing day to day. Uh, and specifically in terms of officials, that will uh, uh, pan out in many, many different ways, as Jan sort of alluded to. Uh, and I think there's a comment from Nigel in the chat around what's the risk. The risk isn't just about 
uh, getting out there to officiate. It's that have people social distanced? Are they gonna have space in the dressing rooms? That fear and that anxiety potentially can become really, really overwhelming. And uh, a usual response to fear and anxiety will be to attract, perhaps avoid that, that situation and then retention then will become a very, very big problem, I would suggest. Again, you've got a whole range of things. You've touched on isolation, that isolation away from colleagues, even in a professional environment, but perhaps even more so at grassroots. Uh, again, looking at that loss of being able to do the sport that you, you love every week, as Jan mentioned to before. And there's also elements of grief and loss, not just about the sport, but everybody in this chat will have different views of what they've lost. They will know people who've had COVID or they won't. So there's that sort of um, uncertainty with, because that poses risks. So if you've known somebody who's uh, unfortunately died from COVID-19, like I have working in a health service, you become very aware of the potential risks. Everyone will be on a bit of a different spectrum at this point in time. There's going to be a lot of people who will have perhaps health anxiety. So worried about their own physical health, the physical health of others bringing back if you're in a group of players and then you take that. Uh, potential infection back to your own home how do you mitigate against that risk what's the preparation for you know any official in this situation whether that's at the top level to think about those things have officials been asked about those potential fears before they get out there or is the assumption that you'll just get back out there and there's a bit of space so so, so for me there's a lot of issues there there may be obsessive compulsive ideas about fear about cleanliness and cleaning, obviously everyone's forced to wash their hands. We've had it drummed into us all that we're potentially going to die if we go outside. So that's a big uh, message that lots of people have taken on board. So when you're out there officiating or being part of a crowd, then that becomes perhaps a bigger issue. So, so, so for me, I think there should be lots of different elements of that, that preparation of people coming back. And again, at grassroots, that may or may not happen uh, as thoroughly as the top level perhaps. So there's lots of things that potentially could be in place, but fear and uncertainty is a good one. Social anxiety, you know, I, I used to sort of um, uh, feel a bit, uh, let's see, you feel a bit, uh, what's the word? Um, a bit awkward sometimes if you're out and about, you might say hello to someone or people will smile at you. Uh, however, now we're in the, in the realms of being in a situation where we've been quite happy for people to walk around us and avoid us and start thanking everybody for it. So, so we've got a bit of a mindset that's changed as well, and, and that's definitely going to impact in the officiating of sport. So I think there's lots of preparation from a mental health point of view that may be needed. And it's interesting seeing the comments in the chat around how, I think it's in Australia, they're talking about how the nervousness or you know the mental health issues for uh, in junior competitions is perhaps uh, being seen very, very quickly in that four-week return. So there's lots of things out there. But, and again, for me, I think in mental health, you're always trying to prepare people and trying to make sure they've got the skills and techniques to, to begin to manage it. So I think officials definitely need to begin to do that. Or people might just be sat at home and just not come back. Yeah, I think, thanks, Phil. I think that's a, that is a concern, isn't it? And I think we're hearing that, you know, from different people and, and I've seen the chat as well. And I, I just wonder, Carlo, in, in Italy, did, did the Serie A officials... Um, have any coverage of, of the sort of mental health implications of returning and and how was that dealt with by the association there? Okay, so that's actually, honestly, we don't have, you know, that uh, psychological support, you know, in this science, you know, that actually that, that this is uh, something that actually uh, listening to, you know, to this, uh, you know, uh, panel, actually, I realized that probably you now that should be something that uh, we should take into account, you know, because, yeah, Honestly, we don't have a psychological support in this kind. But anyway, if I can add um, my you know, experience in, in Italian uh, and providing you with the Italian situation is actually that we are, you know, uh, after this, uh, you know, the a meeting, I have another one with, you know, my uh, technical department because our concern nowadays, because I'm not just, you know, dealing with the uh, Serie A referees, I'm uh, also the, the, you know, a fitness, a sports scientists of all the referees of Italy. And now our concern is the return to play of the lower level leagues. And so that's now that uh, we have, uh, because actually, you know, you know the, all the, you know, the procedures that have been, you know, set by the, you know, the uh, health, uh, you know, service in Italy actually cost, 
that it's estimated that it costs 80,000 euros, you know, that all the, the measure that you have to undertake in order to protect the players and running, you know, the, the championship. And this is absolutely not a cost that can be uh, sustained by the lower level uh, teams. And as well, you now the problem is that, you know, that uh, it, it, uh, we were able, uh, we have been able to implement, you know, the medical, you know, check for the top level referees but uh, it's still a concern how to implement that you know for the lower level uh, referees and means that you know uh, so translating into uh, uh, english uh, you know uh, situation in county level you know provincial level regional level and that's you know that uh, actually because in italy we have 35,000 referees and when we talk about you know serie referee we are talking about 21 referee and 40 assistant referee Referees, so that means that actually we are talking uh, about something that is uh, a small part of, of a big picture, and so that's uh, again, you know, that uh, it's a I think that you know that if uh, because they are our referee are professional, they can deal, uh, you know, they have a, a personal support. We don't have, you know, that the sort of uh, team support for, you know, that uh, from the uh, psychological uh, point of view, but they have uh, their own mental coach, some of them, you know, that they, they are using them, you know, in, in this uh, special situation. So that's about, anyway, that's uh, the, the, probably the concern is, you know, that they know that are the, the referees that, you know, that because that football is not just Serie A, okay, football is uh, <laughs> all Italy that they returns to play because now, it's a, uh, it's a, in our DNA football, right? In Italy, so that's and there's something that just you know, uh, how to say, to give you a, just a, a movie, you know? <laughs> and then there is a, a, a and the world as such is and different, you know? it's uh, shut down, and so this problem, uh, you know that uh, so that I appreciate that the, the colleague in from USA that actually there is also a a parents uh, concern the parents and, and you know that they cannot attend you know their uh, their players and so that's you know this is a, a big problem also in Italy of course about that and we are not there still you know because actually for us uh, I have a meeting uh, <laughs> late this uh, afternoon about that because actually they set you know the training camp for the return to play for what we call uh, Serie D, that means the, the fourth division. But actually, they are, you know, uh, uh, I think that there are uh, 400 referees and 800, uh, you know, assistant referees. So <laughs> we have a problem with 21. So, okay, how can we deal with the, the coronavirus? That yeah, So that's, I, I can update you that, that nowadays that we have a, Really, is not the situation like uh, uh, three months ago, of course. But anyway, there are, uh, so I'm using uh, the terms of uh, Jacob's bubbles that actually, you know, that are, they are, you know, that where the coronavirus is still, you know, uh, getting back in a way, you know. And so that's the means that actually that, uh, though the crisis uh, is not yet, uh, you know, uh, under control, you know, or totally under control. And so that's, uh, again, you know, locker rooms, so that's in Serie A, San Siro, okay, local room, it can be sanitized. So I can, so that, I don't know, in a, at county level, this can be done, you know. So that's, that's I think, the problem that, and uh, so far, so that uh, I can also have, uh, I, I only have, you know, that, you know, uh, speculation about that, and I've not that numbers, but actually it's, uh, that's the problem, in my opinion. Yeah, thank you, Carlo. I think I think that's a great point. You know, we, we're talking about with Carlo in Italy, him overseeing the Serie A referees, but of course, in every sport, in every country, there are referees below that. And of course, you know, there's some really interesting comments on on the chat as well about, um, you know, what from from David over in in Australia talking about what's happening there, um, and, and Philip also giving some really interesting stuff. And one of the comments is about, you know, what what happens when a a match official sees a COVID incident, or how will they cope if there's been a COVID incident, or they've been involved in one, or or maybe you know they've had. To, um, someone who's played is tested positive and then everyone 
then can't participate anymore. And I guess, you know, from a, a sort of well-being perspective, mental health perspective, that, that's a problem. But also from a support perspective, we're going to need to support these guys because otherwise, you know, that might happen and they just think, well, you know, I don't, I don't need this. It's, it's too dangerous almost. I don't know what anyone, Phil, from a mental health perspective, what would you think there? Yeah, I, I, I just think there's so many different things involved in terms of, A, just generally speaking for everyone as a human being, but then in terms of all the, the change sort of roles and rules, uh, some sports are actually changing rules as well to, 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 to combat COVID-19. So, so, so I think there's so many different, really, really sort of tiny elements that are going to build and build and go lead to perhaps lots and lots of really big concerns. It's that that fear and uncertainty, as I said before, is always going to be a, a really big issue, I think. And those COVID-19 issues, in, in a health service, we see COVID-19 issues all the time, whether that's someone not wanting to wear a mask or not wanting to do that or spitting at people. There's lots of things that happen that you wouldn't be able to sort of uh, usually deal with. So again, having some preparation for that and some people's behaviour isn't always fantastic, whether it's in public or on a field. Uh, so therefore, yeah, preparation of how you're going to manage that particular situation could be really, really crucial. A, to keep the game flowing as you would like to do so normally, but it's a really, really difficult one, I think, because players won't know that if you're used to following the rules or trying to bend them, uh, potentially you're also going to maybe use some things to your advantage as well. And, you know, officials have to be prepared for that, I think. And, you know, how are you going to do that? Yeah, I think that's right. Cool. And I think that comes back to, you know, we, we don't necessarily know what the landscape's going to look like, what, what the matches might might look like when, when we're sort of back playing. And I think that is, you know, will create apprehension. Um, and interestingly, Ian over in um, Canada has, has said on the chat, you know, do we need new training measures, you know, given the sort of psychological support that's, that's perhaps required now because of this situation? Do we need new training measures for official trainers, mentors, new contacts in detecting and addressing distress and mental health for these, you know, officials? Is, is that something we, we really need to think about? Um, I don't know, you know, Michael over in, in Northern Ireland, what do you think in terms of your experiences in supporting these match officials? Yeah, uh, absolutely. And the support mechanisms... Um, need to be stronger now uh, uh, you know I think I just read a comment from from Jacob there where even in pre-COVID they were learning and developing needs and, and really the referees were, were looking for um, the education and development and the sport elements are, are going to have to be integral now um, so if, it, if the sport restarts again any sport and it looks different I believe referees need some um, something to lean on. They, they might need some education around what those challenges are going to be and how they can navigate those challenges. And I think if, if some support is put in place, it will allow any individual referee to have a bit more confidence the, to be able to officiate a game uh, with new conditions, new surroundings, um, new issues that, that may arise. Um, support element, I think, should be there anyway because it, it's important for the development of, of anyone who is officiating. But it's it's going to be needed more than ever, um, and I think someone mentioned about uh, psycho uh, psych psychological coaches or someone that is able to help them with the mental side of the game. I think that's going to be ne very necessary moving forward. Thanks, Michael. And I, I think this moves on nicely from that point. Is a really interesting question from Dane, who has said, you know, do people think that clubs or even governing bodies potentially could offer greater guidance? To participants or challenge behaviour because and, and Dane's given an example of a match he was in you know involved with where protocols weren't adhered to people had to be disciplined players and managers because they weren't following guidance and guidelines I think that's going to be inevitable to a certain extent I think that will happen when people try and push these these boundaries perhaps and um, I wondered Jan from your perspective in the Netherlands and then perhaps Jacob as well what, what you thought about that Yeah, it's difficult for um, for referees with all these uh, things in place, and how do you act on it, and how what's your role in it? It's difficult to uh, to find um, what should be the role of the official in, in such cases, and, and what should be the uh, up to 
teams and responsibilities and it's it's it's, it's very difficult and there's just a few matches been played now I've seen no major incidents there but um, yeah I'm waiting until the fo big football returns like if there's games every Saturday again and, and there's more matches on on a location than just one friendly then yeah it, it, it gets difficult to manage I think yeah I think that's I think that's really interesting and I think I think there will be challenges hopefully they're not you know not too often and, and it doesn't happen too much um, Jacob what about in the in the states yeah it's it's interesting I, when the, the last couple of uh, folks were talking and then when, when Yan just talked it uh, so much especially at some of our, our the the lower levels and some of the grassroots things that happen in, in various sports in the US the um, the the sponsoring organizations of tournaments or of games or of, of leagues often push so much of the responsibility for crowd control and all of those things to match officials and umpires you know normally and I think it's partly because Maybe they don't want to pay money to have staff there, uh, you know, policing the parents or the or the crowd or whatever. But um, but also probably I think they just don't want to deal with it, right? Like oh, that's the referees, you know, or the, or the umpires' problem. Um, and so um, so it is interesting. What what will happen if 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 in some of those grassroots leagues or the you know the youth and amateur leagues were already expected to do more than just call you know, balls and strikes or, or raise our flags for offsides or do all of those, you know, make those in-game decisions and then also manage the sidelines and the personalities and the behaviors there. Like, you know, Carlo was talking uh, before we came on about the, the coaches, you, you know, yelling at each other or whatever. We're, we're expected to manage all of that. But but what do we do if a, if a player or a coach or, uh, a, uh, you know, a member of the staff isn't adhering to those guidelines? Why should it fall upon the referee to, to police that? My fear, at least in the U.S., is that will be an expectation of us. So then you're just creating one more layer of conflict for us to, to manage that, that we shouldn't have to manage anyway, right? So, so that's – and one of the other things I, I was thinking um, – when, when maybe when, when Michael was talking, but one of the things, uh, and, and I caught actually from a, a few of the questions in the chat, thinking about the, the changes in protocols um, and, the, and the social distancing and not being able to shake hands and, and at least from in my sport, um, you know, basketball, one of the things that makes us, can make someone a really good official is that ability to have private conversations, you know, or close conversations, a word in the ear um, during a timeout or during a free throw or something like that, right? Um, I, I see when I go to matches, I see how the fourth official interacts uh, really closely with coaches in some respects, right? And can, and can mitigate, um, uh, you know, uh, behavioral, uh, you know, issues before they become real problematic. And so if this is what, if this is what makes us good as referees is developing trust and building relationships with players and building relationships with coaches, how are we going to be able to do that if I'm six feet away, if I'm not allowed to, to, to come next to you and have a private word uh, or to address a question um, and so I'd be curious to know, you know, how those who train referees, uh, how, how, how will that potentially impact our ability to be good at our craft? Yeah, I think, I think that's really, really good point, Jacob. And I think, you know, uh, looking at the chat as well, you, you referenced a couple of points on there, you know, David over in, in Australia and, and Philip are talking about, you know, you know, people coughing and, and at each other and, and spitting and things like that. Clearly, I think we're going to have to have more uh, sanctions around those sorts of things because they, they take on heightened importance in the current climate. You know, and until we've got some sort of handle on how we can control COVID-19 a bit better, I think we need some sort of guidance around that. Um, and I think, Jan, what about in terms of the, the training of, of referees? Has, has the uh, KMVB, the association in the Netherlands, mention anything about how that might be approached um, no not yet um, what they did mention specifically is that referees are not responsible for uh, 
behavior on the field of play. They can address it to the captain, but they, the clubs are responsible for distancing, and, um, but the referees can say something to the captain. But in terms of education, um, instructing referees, no, instructing referees has been off until, from, from March until now. And there's not even been online sessions. There's just one webinar about the new laws of the game changes, but there's nothing uh, set to instructors or shared with instructors about how to deal with that, how to pay attention to these details of the game that are not about the laws of the game, but are about mental things. And um, uh, they're not talked yet about how to instruct your referees um, to, when you can't communicate or bond bond with the players or build a relationship um, that's something that's quite important and um, it, it, it's even up to some referees just start as a referee now they're newbies they just started the course they did maybe one or two games early March or, or in February and then it all got shut down so I try to communicate with my pupils uh, every now and then try to highlight some webinars try to get them motivated ask them if they have questions to keep them like interested in the job of being a referee because they they just did one or two games they might got lost and they thought oh I found a different hobby or it's quite a pleasure to stay at home or it, it's also about retention rates and um, they might even drop off before they started um, and and also for for current referees they um, yeah you really want to help them and I hope there will be uh, much more attention for, for things like that, like how to educate them in, in a manner that they can still manage the game and uh, use yeah, communication skills and, and um, psychological things to, to be a better referee. Uh, yeah, thanks, Jan. I think David has just made a great point uh, just at the end of the, the messages there that, that, you know, it does, the, the provision does vary quite wildly across sports, um, and, a, and between different areas within a country, even. I mean, you know, some of our research, for example, match officials have, have, have quite clearly said that, you know, what's been really good in one area has not been so good in another. If they've moved between leagues or, or different associations at a regional or, or local level. And of course, that again takes on heightened importance in the current climate because we have to get that, that advice right. People have to be confident in what they're doing. And, and if there are transgressions or problems and the disciplinary processes need to be quick and they need to be efficient because otherwise we're going to find ourselves in a, in a very difficult situation. And I think obviously Jan talking there about the experiences in the Netherlands and, and also the fact that there isn't any CPD, you know, so not only are referees not training, but they're not developing, you know, they're sort of standing still. Match officials generally are sort of treading water a little bit, which again, is, is not great in terms of the sort of development. Um, I'm conscious of time. We're literally at, at the hour pretty much. So I think we're going to try and wrap up here. Um, and that just, just leaves me to say really thanks to everyone that's, that's contributed on the panel, to Jan, to Michael, to Jacob, to Phil and to, to Carlo. I think it's been a wide ranging and really, really interesting discussion across sports and um, across different topics as well in terms of the support, um, the training, the development, the recruitment, retention. And I think we've seen big differences between countries as well, which, you know, is to be expected given how we're responding to COVID-19 across the world, you know, and the challenges we're all facing at different, you know, stages and levels of infection rates and things like that. So I think it's to be expected to a, to a certain degree. Um, but I just wanted to say thank you to, to everyone for contributing and, and thanks to everyone who's who's joined in and, and sent questions in on the chat which has been um fantastic and, and in fact david just as a final point there is asked about whether the discussion can continue which i think is a, is a great idea um and evolve as leagues return and um i know twitter is a very good platform for that to happen and, and i know loads of the guys on the panel are uh, are on twitter and quite heavily involved so that might be a, a way of doing it we'll also put this session out for those who haven't been able to, to watch it live. So we can we can carry the conversation on around that on social media as well, potentially. Um, but thank you to everyone. Um, we will leave it there for today, but it's been really, really insightful and, and fascinating to be involved with. Thanks very much. Thank you for the